Hi, welcome once again, Dave Sclavi, Giselle. We're here making uh, stuffed cabbage in Dave's live steam kitchen. Still making the steam. Here it is. Look at that steam coming up there. Beautiful. That's the cabbage boiling. Made is over here. Giselle's getting the meat ready. And uh, stuffed cabbage is like a Hungarian thing. But somehow or another, the Italians took it over. I'm Italian. Giselle's Italian. Uh, uh, somehow the Italians took it over. And they make a pretty good stuffed cabbage. So we're going to have that a little bit later for dinner. And we're going to have a little dry bread with it. It's going to be beautiful. Anyway, uh, this video is going to be about my automatic air brake system that I keep talking about. And um, I have a lot of faith in it. Um, this summer, sometime this summer, I'm going to make an actual video of it actually operating and show the, the advantages of it and how it works and, uh, and so on, the safety features of it. And, uh, uh, but for right now, I'm going to do a little bit board, a board diagram and uh, show the components and how they operate and what, what, uh, what they, uh, how they function in the system. So we're going to go do that now, and then we'll see you in a little bit. All right, well, uh, now we're going to cover the basics of the air brake system. It's really nothing different than what George Westinghouse actually designed, or the Westinghouse company in later years actually designed, designed after the H6 brake. Uh, okay, you start off, obviously, air compressor. Now, whether you use steam... And trust me, there is no inch and a half scale steam compressor that will compress enough air to operate this system. Uh, I have one on the engine, but anyway, air, air compressor, being electric, what I use, or whatever. Main reservoirs, whatever, how many you have, it doesn't matter. I have two, a five-gallon tank, and then I have some on a locomotive. And then comes through here, and then this is what's called the distributing valve which distributes the air pressure here through the lines. This is, the green is the equalizing reservoir. This will be the automatic brake. This will be the independent brake handle. This is the automatic brake handle. These are the two um, uh, duplex gauges, two hands per gauge, that means. And this would be uh, a triple valve on the tender. This would be a triple valve on every car. You know, one for every car. And this piece here, I'm gonna, of course, I'm going to go explain each one of these parts. This is what's called a, a, um, a shuttle check. I'll explain that. That's important. This would be what's on the tender. This would be what's on the locomotive. And this cylinder would be on every car. <sighs> Equalizing reservoir. That's important. We're not going to get, I'm not going to get into the mechanics of the valve. But basically what it is, very simple, is a regulator. It regulates air, just like an ordinary regulator you have in your shop. It's no different. What I do is I set this so it's 70 pounds of air in this tank. When this is set to 70 pounds, this allows the diaphragm here, which I'm drawing as a line across, to open up and allow 70 pounds of this 100 and 105 to 150 pounds of air pass through here into the blue line, which is the train line and the tender and so on. This is all the blue, solid blue, all blue is uh, the train line and that's set at 70 pounds and I, of course I set the triple valves to work at 70 pounds well that, that's another story okay so as long as that maintains 70 pounds this is going to maintain 70 pounds if you change this meaning 65 pounds that's going to open up the valve it's going to open this up it's going to release pressure on this side it's going to allow five pounds of this air here not this side but this air to pass into the exhaust, which is on the bottom, and reduce the blue line now to 65 pounds. Okay? And so on and so on. 60, 50, emergency, which is about 50 pounds. Emergency. You go into emergency, brakes are locked. You're not moving that. Right, now, this is the independent. Now, what that does is it's zero pressure when it's off, and as you apply it, it increases the pressure. Same as it. Just take a... An ordinary regulator you have in your shop, it starts out zero and you turn it and it goes up to 5, 10, 15, 20 pounds. It does the same thing here except you've got a handle on it. Okay, and, all right, so you have zero pressure and then as you increase it, 5, 10, 15, 30 pounds, I have it set. 30 pounds, the brakes, are, the wheels are going to slide. There ain't no way you're going to move that. No way. 30 pounds. Now on the K4 here, I have every wheel, every wheel on the entire locomotive has brake shoes. 
lead truck, uh, main drivers, uh, trailing truck, and the tender. All the eight wheels of the tender. We have brakes on all. That's the way the Pepsi did it. I did it the same way. By the way, in case you're going to say, well, the wheels are going to slide on the pilot, I have it set so that's delayed. The delayed pressure. I have a choke in there so the pressure comes on gradually. So as the train's stopping, the locomotive's stopping, it then puts on the, light, the brakes. It don't jam them on. Here, let's talk about this channel check. This is what's on the tender. Now, the tender on my locomotive, on my trains, acts as another car when I use the automatic brake. When I use the independent, it acts as the independent, as one train, one, one braking system. If I put on five pounds uh, of independent air, it's going to go five pounds into the tender. If I use the automatic brake, the tender is going to come on, the engine is going to stay on at five pounds that I originally put on there. And if I want to, what's called, engineers out there will now bail off, in other words, you're dumping the air on the engine, that, what that does is it pulls the, the train a little tighter when you're coming into a stop, it, like the, the downgrade, you know, it just kind of keeps the, the tension. Oh, now, the, the way the shuttle check works is you have two sources of air. In, in, this would be out to wherever you're going to go. Okay, so there's a little check disc in there. It's a disc, actually, and it, whatever pressure is greater, it slides to one side or the other. So if the pressure comes in here and that's greater, it slides over there, goes out. If the pressure on this end comes greater than this pressure, pushes the other way, and it goes to the cylinder. Like th several weeks ago, at the New Jersey Live Stammers, we had a uh, train separation. Steve Bertina was on the first car behind the engine. Train separated, the world came to an end. The locomotive, the 1361, went about another three feet. Brakes came on, just the momentum carried it that far. The tender brakes locked up, stopped the locomotive, the car stopped, everything comes to a halt. Right there. No problem. Now I lost all the air in the, in the main reservoir and I'm going to work on that. Uh, Big John suggested that we use maybe a choke or some kind of a flow uh, check or something that I won't dump all the air because when I had to rehook it up, I had to wait for the air. This would be, anybody out there knows air brakes, this is chamber D. Chamber D. Now, let me explain that. The reason for the auxiliary reservoir is quite simple. Um, Back in the day when they had the old 440s, four, four you know, out there in the West, the old West, they had three cars. They made a brake application, if they had air brakes then, I guess they did, uh, uh, automatic air brakes. They put the air brake on, made a brake pipe reduction. Almost immediately, the pressure dropped and the brakes would come on. As the trains got larger over the years, hundreds of cars, it, the brake pipe is two and a half inches or two or two and a half inches in diameter. So when you made a five pound brake pipe reduction, it took quite a bit of time for that brake line, the train line, the whole entire mile long brake line to, to evacuate that five pounds. So the train started, you know, it took a longer time for those brakes to come on. So as the guy's riding down the railroad and he's watching the signal, doing whatever he's doing, looking up, first thing you know, bingo, he's down to 10 pounds and he's not even paying attention. All right, so, so now you've made too much of an application. Okay, so what they did was they come up with this little tank, and of course on a locomotive, the little tank is about that big. But on my locomotive, the tank is only about a little, little tank like that, about the size of a small jar. And I'm making the brake pipe reduction in here. I'm making a five pound reduction in here. That automatically will evacuate this line to, to match this tank. I don't have to look at it. I have a detent on my, my lever. As I come back with it, I hit that detent, I hold it there, that's five pounds, and the brakes just come on, and that's what's called the service stop. They just come on gradually, and it's just like driving a car. You don't come up to travel like jam your brakes on, you start to brake, brake gradually. It works the same way. You put it on there, it comes to a beautiful stop. Now anybody that's driven, riding, in, ridden on my trains can say, wow, those brakes really work good. And they do. They work great, and I'm major advocate of using these brakes. I don't like vacuum at all, and a lot of guys at PLS use vacuum, and it's quite successful. And it is an easier brake to operate, to, to, um, to build, but, and it's less expensive, but um, you don't have the fail safe with it. It's either on or off. With mine, I had the fail safe, which is the major reason for doing it, and it, and it works prototypically. It works exactly like the prototype of his full size brother. It works exactly the same. And I've never had a problem with moisture because 
it's all the triple valves and everything are all done with diaphragms. So they're rubber diaphragms and moisture really doesn't affect it. Well, hope you enjoyed the uh, explanation of the air brake system. Um, I developed it about 1985 and um, it took me quite a while to perfect it and uh, just recently I've been able to miniaturize it. So um, that's been the, the big um, difference in being able to bring it out in, for inch and a half scale. So uh, if there's any questions, please email me and I'll be glad to answer them for you. I'll try to get any pictures up there. Right now we're having a stuffed cabbage. Well, I'm telling you, this is great stuff. And we're going to have a little wine with it. It's a cheap bottle of wine, a five dollar bottle, but after a couple of drinks, what's the difference? Nobody knows. Nobody cares. So, so here's to you and your live steam projects. We'll see you again on the next video.